this part will be about um, how do we combine these two languages um, in an analysis. And I will quickly start with the motivation, why, why at all we want to do that, and then quickly go through different levels of how we could integrate those two languages. In the practical parts, we will then actually see several of these levels. But just as a disclaimer at the beginning, um, it's not that, that I have been doing this since a long time. I only started maybe uh, half a year ago and I'm, I'm still learning a lot of new things. Also the, the theory and exercises we will do on this part are barely scratching the surface of, of what's out there that allows you to do this integration of these two languages. So it's a, uh, Probably we're going to see some some questions arising that that I will not be able to answer, and I I would like to ask you to bear with me. So why why would we want to inter, to to integrate those two languages, particularly for data science? They have some things in common. They're both open source programming languages. They both have really large communities, and these communities are very active and are providing new libraries and tools continuously, basically. Um, both languages also have a well-defined interface to, to compiled languages like C or C++, and that makes it also easy to, to um, go to that lower level if, if efficiency is, is really what's asked for. But then they're also different. Python is, is a really general purpose programming language. Um, it's really cleanly designed efficient that is very modular and therefore it's usually the language of choice for people who want to deploy software who want to uh, roll it out to their customers and who have large projects with a lot of interacting parts um, and there are some really great python packages like scipy or scvelo if you are interested in single cell data or also sidekick learn keras or pytorch if you're interested in machine learning. So that, that's all things that speak for using Python. Similarly, R has, has a number of things speaking for it. It's, it's more a statistical modeling and data analysis language designed by statisticians. It's therefore really great for exploring data and visualized data. And also there we have a number of packages, mostly from the Bioconductor project that are really strong motivators to use that language, like just naming a few here, HR, DESeq2, Scran or Skater, Tidyverse, ggplot2, and Shiny. So if you, if you Google Python versus R, you will find a, a million and one different comparisons of the two languages. I quite liked this tweet here, which compared R to Batman and, and Python to Superman. Um, but that's not really what I want to do here. I don't want to discuss pros and cons of these because why would you choose if you can have both of them? <clears throat> and um, in, in a typical data analysis project, we, we already combine various tools from different sources because it's very unlikely that any one single tool or programming language will give us everything we will need. But at the same time, it's also nice to have an analysis workflow that is as simple as possible, that has, let's say, few scripts or a few steps and few intermediate files. And in my, my personal case, the reason why I got into this was really because I, I'm usually more an R and Bioconductor user, and I use that primarily to analyze single cell transcriptomics data. But there is a, a very nice package from the Thais lab called SCVelo that does uh, that implements RNA velocity analysis. So you will actually hear more about that package tomorrow. And so I was in the situation where I had to combine SCVelo with my existing R bioconductor workflow. So when you when you're thinking about integrating those two things. Um, you can you can do this in many ways, of course, and and a simple way would be 
you're just breaking your, your analysis workflow, your pipeline into chunks that are homogeneous. So each chunk is either something that happens purely in R or something that happens purely in Python. And you run them one after the other. And, and that works really easily. The, the, the only problem is that these chunks don't really talk to each other. Um, and at the end of each chunk, you need to kind of save the state of the project, usually in the form of some output files. And in the beginning of the next chunk, you need to read that state back in. So what you're ending up usually in a project like that is with a lot of disk space dedicated to saving these intermediate files. And also some plumbing code that writes them out or reads them back in. Um, <clears throat> since a long time already, there are so-called, or what I call bridge packages out there. So, so these are packages that are either a Python package that allows you to interact with R or an R package that allows you to interact with Python. Um, I call them bridges because you would still only primarily work with one language, but through that special package, you get kind of a bridge towards the other language. And we will see such bridge packages in action later in the, in the exercise. Um, I think those are, are really great. And some of them are quite, quite uh, comprehensive in what functionality they provide. Um, but they are specialized packages and they kind of force you to, to understand the functionality and also the vocabulary of that specialized package. So in order to use Python from R, it's not enough to just know Python. You also need to know the, the, the interface of the bridging package, which would be reticulate, for example. And the same is true for the other direction. You need to know how RPy2, for example, works and what kind of methods and functions it provides in order to, to use that bridge. So for me, this is not super ideal. And uh, it also doesn't allow me to just have my unmodified R code and my unmodified Python code and have them talk to each other. So the, that would be something that I would call a truly integrated workflow where I can write a single script that has R parts and Python parts without me having to use a special interface. So a lot of the, the integration of the two worlds would happen transparently for me. That, that would be kind of my preferred solution. And it turns out that actually we have solutions like that out there, which we will also see in the exercises. So what's really special about that is that we, we have objects that will be shared between the two worlds. So we can have, for example, a data frame in R that is available as a Pandas data frame object in Python. And that, that of course, the, the nice thing about that is we don't have to, to write that many output files anymore. Um, just so you know, um, if you have a question or so, feel free to interrupt me anytime by just raising your hand in the Zoom um, feedback. Okay, so let me very quickly give you just a few words on each of these three approaches. So as I said, breaking things up into pure R or Python chunks um, is something we have maybe already done already. Um, we can still organize workflows and integrate them to some degree by, for example, using make files or snake make or NIME or whatever common workflow language. Um, that's super flexible, but I said it's not really integration. It's more um, uh, one after the other with a requirement to connect the different chunks yourself. So that's not really what, what I want to talk about in, in this block. In the bridge approach, we have two prominent packages, one that's called reticulate, which allows you to use Python from R, and one that's called RPy, which allows you to, to use R from Python. And we will use both of those in the exercises. I think they would be the, the method of choice if you 
Anyway, you want to primarily use one language and just do a few things in the other language. But you need to kind of know a bit about those packages, which I see is their biggest disadvantage. And then finally, we have the, the truly integrative approach. Before I go there, just a, a quick word about display conventions. Now for the slides and also later for the exercises, um, you, you see these um, blocks with a colored background. They, they are actually uh, showing code and the background color actually indicates what language that code is from. So the gray would always be for, for R, while this, this yellowish background color would always indicate Python code. And yeah, actually, I don't think I have any bash blocks in, in, the, in the exercises, but those would be blue. So a few examples be, before we go through the truly integrated um, uh, level. If I want to use reticulate to call Python from R, it's actually quite easy. You load the reticulate library, then there is an import function, which is an R function that allows you to import Python modules. And what you get back is, is an object that is kind of a handle to the, to the methods and functions defined in that Python module. And you can then call them using the dollar operator. So in, in Python, you would actually use the dot operator. Uh, but here you, you then use the, the dollar a bit like, like this function would be uh, a list element of the Python package object. It behaves a bit like a list. And in this case, you, you see the example is just listing the files in the current directory. Uh, of course, in R, we get back an R character vector. In, in Python, if we do the same thing in Python, what we get back is a, is a, is a list of strings. So you see that this list of strings is automatically converted into an R character vector when I call the function from R. So you could say reticulate in that sense is not, there's not so much vocabulary you need to, to learn. This is relatively close to how the code would look like in Python. These type conversions are available for, for a lot of default data types. I, I have you here the conversion table. So here you see the R data type and the Python data type and reticulate automatically converts between those two in both directions. And here are some examples. So I, I guess any, any standard data structure in R is, is covered here. Um, but of course, special objects like S4 classes, like for example, the, the single cell experiment object that we may work, use later in the course, that's not automatically translated. I will talk more about that later. And because reticulate um, really does this bridging very nicely, it's it's also used widely in other packages that may even hide the fact from you as an R user that you're calling Python code in the background. And, and two prominent examples of that are the R TensorFlow and the R Keras libraries, which actually call the Python libraries in the background through functionality provided by Reticulate. Um, there is a question um, about whether Python can import sparse matrices via reticulate. And um, yes, it can. And actually, there will be an example doing that in the exercises. So let's look at the other direction. If you're more a Python programmer and you would like to use R functionality, you can use RPy2. It's actually much older than Reticulate. Reticulate is maybe only two years old, while RPy2 is, I think, at least 10 years old. And uh, there was even an RPy 
before that. And you will see in the exercises, RPI2 is actually a, a huge package with a lot of different um, functionalities. There is, for example, a low level and a high level interface, plus a specific support for, for Jupyter Lab notebooks. Um, the high level interface looks like this. I'm importing the, the library in, in Python, and I can then use the .r um, object from, from the R objects as an entry point into, into the R world. And I can basically ask for a bit like, like this dot R would be a dictionary for elements where the dictionary key here that I'm asking for actually refers to the object name in the R world. And what I'm getting back is then automatically translated into a Python object of the, of the suitable type. In this case, you see it's actually a, a list of floats. And in R, <clears throat> that's the same thing in R directly. And it's actually the same value. It's just that R does some um, rounding when it's printing that variable. So in the type conversions are, I would say, more flexible in RPI2, but also much more complicated. Um, the, the low level interface is something that is very efficient. It, it actually hardly copies over things. It's just wrapping the R objects and gives you Python pointers to them. So that's good for speed and efficiency. And you, you even have a, a high, in the higher level interface, it does do some copying and conversion using these converter uh, classes, and you can also create new conver converter classes for specific objects that may not be supported yet. And one of these that we will actually see later in the exercises is converting from a from a single cell experiment object into an AND data object. I can't really go much further into details here. If you are interested, then you will find more information under this link. And so finally, um, the truly integrated uh, level where I'm using a single script or notebook that uses both languages. Um, they are available both in RStudio and they're actually driven by Reticulate in the background. And they're also supported by Jupyter. And in this case, they are driven by, by RPI, specifically by RPI IPython or magic, and we will see both of these in the exercises. So I think those probably for me are the easiest to use. My personal favorite is RStudio writing R Markdown documents um, with the reticulate in the background that allows me to just include Python chunks in it. Um, of course, things need to be set up properly. So of course you need a, a Python installation. Of course the, the Python modules need to be there. And of course you need to tell Reticulate which Python to use. And we will see how to do that in the exercises. Um, before we actually start doing that, um, I would like to just say a few words about, about notebooks in general. I, I found this hilarious presentation by Joel Cruz, who is a, is a data scientist, who's also written a couple of books about data science and is a, is a Python programmer. And he basically had this presentation at JupyterCon 2018, where he, he says he doesn't like notebooks. He was talking about Jupyter notebooks, but I think his arguments apply equally to, to R Studio notebooks. And in a nutshell, um, he says notebooks are bad because they allow you to run the different chunks of code out of order. And by doing that, or by editing, let's say an, an upstream block and just rerunning that upstream block, but not all the downstream blocks, you could create an incoherent state of your notebook and that may be confusing. That's essentially his, 
his message and I, I fully agree with that and that's why I also wanted to mention that quickly. So how does this look like in, uh, in our studio? Uh, here you see a screenshot. You can really have these code blocks that are started in an R Markdown document by the three back ticks. And then in, in, uh, in these way, curly brackets, the language that the code will, will be parsed with. So this is an R block and this is a Python block. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So you can really use your pure Python language in that script as you do your pure R without having to learn the bridge syntax. Still, you are able to access objects from the other side using the special pi R objects or the special R Python object. For example, here you see I'm, I'm using an R chunk that accesses the Y here, which is a NumPy array via the pi object. I don't want to spend too much time here. We will see that in the exercises. And similarly in Jupyter, you can do that by using these special percent %R or percent percent %R indicators at the beginning of a line or of a chunk to indicate that this cell in the notebook is actually containing R code. So with that, I'm, I'm through the introduction.